Welcome to today's program titled a special multi part series guidance on paid family leave laws part 9 paid family and medical leave law comparisons challenges and federal outlook. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged in to the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q and a box on the right hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to all attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you'll see a legal disclaimer. This presentation has been prepared by Seifarth Shaw, LLP, and the American Benefits Council for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Josh Seidman. Josh, please go ahead. Thank you, Kate. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the ninth segment of our Paid Family Leave webinar series. We have a really exciting agenda for you today and joining me to bring you today's content are two of our paid leave team experts here at Seifarth, Christina Duslack and Renata Walker, and a special guest from the American Benefits Council, uh, Eileen Schumann, who's Senior Vice President of Health Policy with ABC. And among the many, many hats that Eileen wears, uh, she is an expert in the paid family leave space. So we're super excited to have her joining us today. And she'll, you'll be hearing lots of great content from Eileen uh, later on in today's program. Uh, let's look at the next slide. We'll go through uh, the program overview quickly, give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll start you off with a, an overview of the paid family leave, paid family medical leave landscape, what activity has been happening, which states are new to the patchwork. We'll then turn our attention to comparisons of select substantive topics across the mandatory paid family and paid family medical leave laws via a new infographic that SciFarth and ABC jointly prepared. We'll then have a really exciting discussion on some of the more complicated challenges that the patchwork of paid family leave laws creates for both employers and employees. So lots of really good content there. And then we'll wrap up today with a discussion on federal paid family leave activity, uh, some pieces of legislation that are noteworthy that have been introduced, uh, as well as uh, some additional activity um, in a bipartisan fashion. So it's a really uh, unique uh, activity going on with paid leave at the federal level that you'll hear some info on. Uh, we'll wrap up then with questions and final thoughts. So let's kick things off. Uh, with the paid family leave, paid family medical leave overview. Uh, on the next slide, you, you'll see we have some key terminology that is worth going over just to level set us as we get into more of the nuances uh, later throughout the presentation. So for starters, we have key terms, FML, SDI and TDI, PFL and PFML. So let's go over what each of those means for just a second. FML or family and medical leave typically refers to statutory unpaid family medical leave laws. The most noteworthy of these is the federal FMLA, but there are a number of states that also have these programs in place. It's a specified number of weeks of unpaid job protected leave for eligible workers to take for covered absences, which most notably include the employee's own serious health condition, family member caregiving, as well as bonding with a new child. Then you have the SDI TDI laws, which are statutory disability insurance programs. Now these exist in five states across the country and are really meant to provide wage replacement benefits to employees who are temporarily disabled and unable to work due to a non-work related illness or injury. Then the next bullet point down, we have our PFL and then the next one after that PFML laws. Those are paid family leave versus paid family medical leave with the big difference being that M, right? The medical component. 
The statutory paid family leave laws, the PFL laws, provide wage replacement, sometimes wage replacement plus job protection to eligible workers who are able to take time off for certain covered reasons, most notably bonding with a new child and family member caregiving. What they lack compared to the PFML laws is that M, that medical leave, that time off to care for the employee's own serious health condition. Notably, and as you'll see in a couple of slides, all of the PFL locations also have an SDI law to fill that gap, that missing uh, employee owned serious health condition related absence. Next slide, please. We also have a few, uh, again, additional terms worth noting PSL or paid sick leave, SPSL, EPSL, PHEL, which refer to supplemental paid sick leave laws or public health emergency leave laws in the COVID space, and then company provided time off, like short term disability or STD long-term disability, LTD, and PPL, paid parental leave. Notably, paid sick leave, even though it seemingly is related to paid family leave, it is a distinct topic, a number of differences between those types of laws. Paid sick leave is typically a, a lesser duration of time for not as serious, not as impactful absences, can be run-of-the-mill illnesses, injuries, preventative care. Um, and they usually, they require employers to provide a certain amount of time, paid time, to workers based on their hours worked. Paid sick leave laws are proliferated in states and cities and, and municipalities across the country, even more so than the paid family leave patchwork we're going to see in a second. The COVID leave laws, public health emergency leave laws have mostly all sunset at this point, but there are a few public health emergency leave laws that are still out there because they are permanent laws that will be triggered whenever there is a covered public health emergency leave. And then finally, you have the company provided benefits. Most importantly about th this topic for purposes of today's presentation is thinking about how these policies, STD, paid parental leave, and so forth, run together if they're allowed to with state paid family leave laws. And we'll talk about that later on in today's presentation. Next slide, please. So here's the current landscape of the paid family medical leave mandates that are out there. You can see the five SDI laws, the four PFL laws, California, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, all having an SDI law, and then Rhode Island having its own only an SDI law, not a PFL law. You can also see the states that have PFML programs. Two new states were added to this list in 2023. First, it was the state of Minnesota, which enacted its law in the springtime, doesn't go into effect in terms of providing benefits until 2026. And then over the summer, Maine passed its paid family medical leave program, again, not going into effect until 2026. Big recent developments just last month, the beginning of September on, on the 3rd of that month, Oregon's paid family leave program went live. And in a couple of months from now on 1124, the Colorado program will be going live. So lots of activity going on in these jurisdictions. Next slide, please. And our final slide for this little introduction, there are some new twists in the paid family leave space. These, do, these are not mandatory laws, as we saw on the last slide. These instead are more voluntary, more passive programs. You have two states, New Hampshire and Vermont, that have instituted voluntary PFML programs. The New Hampshire program has been online for the last nine plus months. The Vermont program is going online in phases, as you can see here, uh, being available for purchase uh, for private employers starting in July of 2025. Also, we have seen a number of states, as you can see listed here, and, and it was sort of started by Virginia, add family leave as a class of insurance uh, with respect to their state insurance law. Now, what these impact, these developments really mean and their impact on the development in other states, as well as potentially at the federal level, as breadcrumbs that, that the federal government might be able to follow remains to be seen. But it is interesting, it is unique to see how we have both mandatory paid family leave laws being active and developing and proliferating, as well as these non-mandatory voluntary programs, as well as classes of insurance being added. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Renata and Christina to talk us through our new infographic and some comparisons across a few substantive topics. Thanks so much, Josh. And we can go to the next slide. All right. So paid family and medical leave has a number of substantive topics that employers need to consider when implementing their, their plans and making sure that they're compliant. And now that you've heard more about the landscape of paid family leave and paid family and medical leave laws and how they vary, we're gonna talk about the variation requirements that are imposed on companies. So 
Through a partnership between Cy Farth Shaw and the American Benefits Council, we prepared an infographic, which you're going to see on the next slide. And the infographic displays four of these key topics, qualifying absences, covered family members, length of benefits and duration of leave, and the amount of pay in a little more detail. But it's also important to note that there are more than two dozen other topics. It would take us at least a day to cover all of them in a webinar. We're not going to do that. Um, but, you know, a couple of ones that I do want to highlight that I think really do have a, a pretty big impact when you're trying to um, implement a policy and, and put it, you know, make sure you're complying with all of these laws is employee eligibility, the key definitions such as who's a parent, who's a child, what's a serious health condition, does the law provide job protection, uh, waiting periods. Um, you know, is there a seven day waiting period or do employee, you know, do employees um, get paid immediately upon taking a leave? Um, the interplay with employee employer provided leave and time off uh, the interplay with other laws. So this is really, a, you know, a complicated topic and we've worked pretty hard to distill it to some of the key things so that, um, you know, you can come up, you can kind of visualize where we are at in the landscape. So we're going to go to the next slide now. All right, so here is the infographic. Um, as you can see, um, it provides a helpful tool to see how these laws stack up against each other. And we're actually gonna zoom in. So if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to take a closer look here. So just to introduce you to this. Um, so over here in the first column, we have the locations with mandatory paid family leave laws. Um, so just want to highlight this does not cover the voluntary programs like in New Hampshire, um, and it doesn't include the family leave insurance locations. What it does cover is statutory disability laws. Um, so California, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, you can see that there's, a, you know, a, a note there um, when you get to medical leave. Um, so that is covered by this chart. Um, so this column also includes locations that have passed laws, but have not yet started providing benefits. So Colorado, Delaware, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, all have laws that have passed and are going to be providing benefits um, in the coming years. And you can see Oregon just started offering benefits. So very exciting there. Um, so when we're going across the top of the infographic to talk about topics, I want to hone in a little bit more on the qualifying reasons for use. So those are the first four columns. So you can see medical leave is covered, and that refers to a qualifying absence related to an employee's own serious health condition, if you're talking about a paid family medical leave law, or disability, if you're uh, cover it, talking about a short-term disability law, again, those four states I mentioned previously. When we move to the next column, we're covering family leave. So that includes absences related to bonding with a child or caring with, for a family member with a serious health condition. Um, then in the next column in yellow, you see military exigency and military caregiver leave. Um, you know, I think it's it's helpful to note that only DC, New Jersey, Oregon, and Rhode Island offer no leave under this kind of category of military uh, military related leave. And then of the remaining locations that do provide some sort of military leave, only five of them offer military exigency leave. So even within that narrow category of leave, there's a lot of variation. And then the in green here, we see other leaves. So this category is explained in footnote nine, includes uh, bereavement leave, safe time, bone marrow and organ donation, prenatal care, public health emergencies, COVID related absences. So what this column does is track the number of absences that aren't covered in the previous you know, three columns and shows again, there's a lot of variation uh, especially with some of the newer laws as they add more and more reasons for use. Then when we move on over to this teal blue category, we have the combined leave available to employees uh, across the different types of leave. So, you know, there's different qualifying reasons in which employees can take the leave. And then, you know, the states usually have some sort of cap for the, for the benefit year. Um, so you can see that in this column. And I think it's important to note that, you know, even, you know, when we were dealing with the FMLA, 12 weeks in a benefit year, great. Now with paid family medical leave, we even have some variation within what's the total universe uh, of leave. 
So, you know, you could get a certain amount of leave for medical, a certain amount of family, and then, you know, it's capped overall. But then also you see in a couple of these columns, we say things like an employee could be, could be eligible to receive 12 weeks or 14 weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks. And there, um, that's because there are certain states that provide an additional amount of leave for um, a certain reason for use. So, for example, and it's specifically uh, related to uh, additional leave for pregnancy complications. And those states are Colorado, Connecticut, and Washington. Uh, and you could see noted by the 12 weeks or 16 weeks or the 12 weeks or 14 weeks. <laughs> um, when we move over to the next column here in purple, we're covering the percent of percentage of wages that employees are receiving. So even, you know, how much pay an employee receives is going to vary by state. And most states that what, what we're looking at are things like the employee's average weekly wage, the state's average weekly wage, and then a lot of times some sort of maximum weekly benefit amount that says, okay, you know, if you, you know, at most you can get, you know, $1,084 per week, um, when, you know, when factoring in all of, you know, these different uh, calculations. And then it's also worth noting that Rhode Island here in a little hot pink uh, takes a different approach and bases payment on the employee's highest earning quarter in the base period. Um, and then finally here, the column in brown, um, this column shows the number of different non-immediate family member relationships covered by the law. So in this chart, we cover immediate family members pretty broadly. Um, so that includes child, parent, in-laws, spouse, domestic partner, sibling, grandparent, grandchild. And even with that expansive list, you can see that there are seven locations that offer even more types of family relationships that could be covered. So when looking at this chart and seeing all of the various colors, you also can notice that there's different shading for within the colors. And that is so is is where we're showing where the offers vary the, what the state offers varies so where the offerings under the law are on the lower end the the shade is lighter the shading is lighter then as more leave is provided more qualifying reasons for use are, are allowed more family members are covered more wages provided more types of family member relationships we see the shading get darker so overall, when looking at how all of these laws stack up against each other, it's clear that there are some laws that are more generous than others. But it's not as simple as saying, okay, I'm just gonna take the most generous law and apply that everywhere because there's just too much variation. Um, you know, there's not enough uniformity that is allowing nationwide employers to offer a one size, you know, fits all policy. And even a one size fits most is, is very complicated. So for example, Massachusetts, uh, of the paid family and medical leave laws, at least, provides one of the highest levels of, of job protected leave with 20 weeks medical leave, 12 weeks family leave, and that's capped at 26 weeks. So while that amount of leave um, would um, comply with a lot of these locations, not all of them, but a lot of these locations, um, what their leave requirements are, Massachusetts doesn't offer um, this type of, you know, these leaves for other reasons of use, um, you know, or for other family members. It's, it's, if you can see in this column here, it says none under other types of leave and other types of family members. So those other, those seven locations that have other types of leaves need to be covered, it wouldn't be as simple as saying, let's just go with Massachusetts there. You have to consider these other reasons for use. So we're gonna go, um, you know, into more detail in the presentation later, but underlying all of this at the end of the day is, is also the PFML versus the FMLA obligations. And it should be noted here that nine laws provide additional reasons for use outside of the FMLA. All right. And then if we could just head back to um, the other slide, the previous slide, so we could see the full infographic. And then one thing I want to highlight here in the top right corner is private plan availability. So 12 of the, you know, actually most of the locations provide um, an option for a private plan availability, except for Rhode Island and DC. So that's another difference here that we're grappling with um, as, as uh, you know, as we try to figure out how to comply nationwide. All right, so we're gonna go two slides down now to qualifying events. Okay, 
So digging in a little, uh, it, you know, in more detail here, you can see from this chart that the first four reasons uh, for a qualifying event are related to bonding, um, and then also caring for a family member with a serious health condition. And these are all mandatory, you know, these are covered under all the mandatory PFML laws. Now, when you get to, but not the SCI laws, when you get to your, the employee's own serious health condition, there's variation in terms of how this will be handled, depending on whether it's a PFML or, or, or a paid family leave law or a paid family medical leave law. And the asterisks here, we want to highlight, those are the locations with the separate, separate disability, um, disability laws, so California, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey. All right. So then moving, moving down here, you can see, again, qualifying military exigency covers a number of the locations, not all of them, and then a smaller subset under military caregiver leave. Uh, then we move on to bone marrow, and we're going beyond what the FMLA requires here. So, for example, bone marrow donation. A number of states have unpaid protected leaves related to bone marrow donation. But, as you can see here, Connecticut codified it into its paid leave law. And new to the party here, Maine has actually added organ donation as well as a paid leave uh, reason for use. Um, it should also be noted that some states have included uh, bone marrow donation in their definition of serious health condition. So an example of that would be the New York paid family leave law. An employee could take leave to care for a covered family member who has surgery related to an organ or tissue donation because it's included in that definition of a serious health condition. So that's a good reminder to be looking at your, you know, the definitions for each of these laws when trying to pull together your policies. Next, we have safe time, which is increasingly becoming included in, uh, in these paid family medical leave laws. It's been, been incredibly common in the paid sick leave world. Um, and, you know, even within you know, that, that, you know, the safe, the safe time type of law, there's variations on, in terms of what will be covered, depending on what that definition is uh, of that safe time. So, you know, for example, Colorado includes domestic violence, stalking, sexual assault, whereas Oregon um, includes some of those categories, but then also adds harassment. Um, so definitely something to, to consider there. And then when we go to bereavement leave, um, this is something that was recently added to Washington. And um, Maine, I, I put a little asterisk there for a reason. So Maine's um, has a law, Maine's law is specifically limited to the death of a member of the armed services um, or their serious health condition. So, you know, but again, another variation within that type of leave. Prenatal care. Um, so that could be routine and specialty appointments, exams, uh, treatment associated with pregnancy. So it could just be like a, a regular checkup or an ultrasound, um, or it could cover, you know, more complications or bed rest. So some of this would be covered by medical leave due to a serious health condition, but some of it would not. So it actually does expand the reason for use in, in terms of this type of leave. And then we have our state of emergency or public health emergency related absences in New Jersey, and then also COVID-19 specific absences as well. So lots of variation there, and I'm sure we'll see more to come. All right, next slide. So um, it's clear to see from the chart that there is a lot of agreement among some of the existing laws about who qualifies as a covered family member. And a lot of the basics are child, parent, and spouse. So the ones that we all know and love from the FMLA. And actually, one thing to note is Delaware is the only state that has limited, limited qualifying family members to those three categories. Everywhere else has, um, has additional family members covered. Maryland just amended their law to add domestic partner. Um, New Jersey also has a civil union partner. Um, but then, you know, there also has been expansion into some new categories um, as these laws have evolved. So again, siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, these are all becoming pretty common. And we're going to go to the next slide. Um, so you can see that some of the further expansion includes siblings, grandparents, and grandchild of an employee's spouse or domestic partner, um, or a child spouse or domestic partner. 
And then these last three categories have really expanded what we're looking at here. So, and I would say this is probably the most challenging expansion um, to, um, and that's basically um, a, this broad category of, you know, an individual whose close association with the employee is the equivalent of a family member relationship. Um, so it's, you know, our individual, you know, it's going beyond kind of the typical relationships and requiring you to understand, you know, the unique relationship with the employee and the individual. So Connecticut actually has provided some additional guidance for its law. And it for them, it's any person with whom the worker has a significant personal bond that is like one of the family relationships listed in the statute, regardless of biology, uh, biological or legal relationship. And it'll be situation specific and it'll depend on the circumstances. They give examples like an unmarried significant other of the employee who maintains a familial spouse like relationship or an aunt who relies on the worker for unpaid care. Um, and it's the type of relationship typically seen between parents and children. Um, Washington has gone um, its own way uh, by covering the category of individuals who regularly reside in the employee's home or where the relationship creates an expectation that the employee is going to care for a person and the, that individual depends on the care. Um, you know, Minnesota is similar to Washington, except uh, residence is not required. Um, so, you know, all of these relationships are going to be a little more difficult for administrators to confirm than the, the standard family relationship. All right, next slide. Renata, take it away. All right, thank you, Christina. Um, so another area in which the paid family medical leave laws vary is the length of benefits that are uh, provided to employees. So on this first slide here, we're looking at family leave. Now when we use the term family leave for purposes of this comparison, we are referring to both bonding with a new child following the birth adoption or placement, and also caring for a family member with a serious health condition. Some of the laws are written a little bit differently, uh, either you know, encompassing both of those uh, reasons in a family leave kind of covered reason for use or you know, possibly splitting it out. But just to be clear for you know, purposes of our comparison today, these are the reasons that we are talking about. So as you can see here, the length of family leave benefits varies from six weeks to 12 weeks, um, you know, depending on the location with the majority of the laws falling in that 12 week range. A couple of things worth noting here, um, in Washington, D.C., the length of paid family leave benefits is actually adjusted annually. Um, D.C. breaks family leave down into two different categories. Both of those are currently set at 12 weeks, but of course they are subject to change. And then I also wanted to point out that in Delaware, when that law takes effect, um, uh, or benefits are become available for use in 2026, uh, it will measure certain absences on a 24 month basis rather than the 12 month benefit year that we're accustomed to seeing. On the next slide, you can see that this looks similar to the previous slide. Here we are looking at variations in the length of leave benefits available for an employee's own serious health condition. As you can see here, the length of medical leave benefits available varies from six weeks in Delaware, and again, this is the 24 month period, um, to as much as 52 weeks in California under the SBI program. As you may recall, uh, Josh explained at the beginning of the presentation that uh, some of the early adopters of paid family leave did not actually include the employee's own medical leave as part of the reasons for use, California being one of those locations. So when we say SBI here, that's designating one of the state disability benefit uh, programs. Um, it's also important to uh, be aware that in many states, um, such as Colorado, Connecticut, Oregon, Washington, uh, the length of benefits can actually increase if the employee experiences some sort of complication or incapacitation related to a pregnancy. On the next slide, we're taking a look at those other absences, sort of those outlier reasons that Christina went over. Um, and so, you know, as you're aware, there are many other covered reasons for use beyond sort of that family leave and medical leave that, that we have looked at that vary from state. The covered reasons as well as the length of leave associated with those different reasons varies drastically from as little as seven days for bereavement leave in Washington to as much as 26 weeks uh, of military caregiver leave 
in Massachusetts. And this slide is illustrative, but it's not necessarily all inclusive. There are a couple of nuances um, in Minnesota and Maryland um, that uh, we're awaiting additional guidance on. So I just want to be clear about that point. If we go to the next slide, uh, we're looking at the combined total length of benefits. So this is the cumulative total available to an employee by state. You can see this varies anywhere from 12 weeks to 52 weeks, um, depending on the location, reasons for leave. And again, some of these are extended based on um, additional amounts of leave available. Um, I think I lost my audio for a minute. Uh, additional amounts of leave available for um, complications related to pregnancy. So um, the uh, New Jersey situation is a little bit unclear here as to whether it would be permissible for an employee to take both 12 weeks of paid family leave and um, 26 weeks of SDI under the state program. Um, and so that's why we, we say here potentially 38 weeks. Um, so just a little uh, nuance there. If we go on to the next slide, we'll take a look at the amount of pay. So um, there's a lot of information available on the next few slides that you can take a look at later. But the big takeaway that we want to get from this is that there's just a lot of variation in how states calculate the benefits under these different programs and what percentage of wage replacement is available under each of the laws. So this could be anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of the employee's average weekly wage. Um, up to 100% uh, for a certain percentage of the wage. Um, so if you look at the next slide, or possibly even one after that, or again, uh, is the example that I wanted to look at. So one more slide, I guess. Um, you know, the, the rate of um, wage replacement actually uh, is higher up to the state average weekly wage. And then once you hit the state average weekly wage, it drops a little bit. Um, so, and also the, the maximum weekly payment can vary pretty greatly here as well. Anything as low as $900 a week up to about $600 a week, depending on the state. And it's important to note here that these amounts change pretty frequently. Um, and many jurisdictions are going to change every year. So this is an area that's very important to, you know, be aware of, particularly to the extent that you're trying to coordinate company provided benefits. Um, with these types of leave, you know, you'll want to be aware and be checking for updates on a regular basis. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll talk about the challenges for employers and employees. So the discrepancies and the dissimilarities that we have been discussing here, as well as the ones that exist in other substantive areas of paid family medical leave laws really create challenges for employers and employees alike. And the overarching impact of this patchwork is that this requires multi-state employers to treat similar workers differently, you know, based on their work location. So this can result in employees who are similarly situated in that they're doing the same job, you know, they have the same responsibilities and that sort of thing, but they're in a different state. They actually end up receiving different benefits um, in terms of covered absences, length of leave, that sort of thing. And so this can certainly create a sense of unfairness or inequity amongst the employees, and it can also be administratively challenging for employers. So we're going to spend the next several minutes discussing a few of these challenges in further detail. Uh, the first one being remote and hybrid workers. Um, so, you know, particularly in the post-pandemic world that we are living in, we have a lot of employees who are working, um, you know, in hybrid roles or they're, you know, working from home in one state, but they're, uh, you know, tied to an office that's in a different state. And so this is an area um, certainly becoming more and more relevant. So whether a telecommuter is covered really depends on the applicable law and the particular telecommuting arrangement. Um, as a general rule, you know, typically if an employee works 100% remotely from their home in a, a TFML jurisdiction, they're going to be covered by their you know, home state law. To the extent that they're working partly from home in you know, one TFML covered state and then partly in an office in another state, there's going to be a much more fact-specific analysis that we would have to dig into. 
Um, so at that point, I will go ahead and pass this over to you. Thank you, Renata. Well, one of the most vexing challenges for employers having to comply with this patchwork of different state uh, paid family medical leave laws, I think if we can advance to the next slide now, um, is the inconsistency with the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act. Since 1993, for 30 years, employers have a familiarity with the unpaid federal FMLA leave and know what those terms mean, know who's bound by them, what employers are covered, what employees are covered, what family members are covered, and what covering absences are. But as the chart that we just looked at and as we've gone through revealed the divergence between this federal FMLA standard and the state standards are different and profound and even the states themselves differ. So just a couple of ways in which they differ and what that really means, I think, for employers. Well, just, you know, there's there's a broader um, there's a broader definition of employers that are covered. And Renata, you just talked about remote workforce um, and the fact that for most existing state paid family medical leave laws, they apply to employers that just have one or more employee in the relevant jurisdiction. Also, employee eligibility. Um, it's basically, it's much more generous, much more broader with respect to employee eligibility too. And I think, you know, particularly challenging, you know, next slide is just, is that whole chart depicted the whole definition of how can the FML, you know, what's the reason for use? So again, defined reasons for under the FMLA, um, a much broader and divergent uh, list of reasons for which the leave could be used under the state patchwork, the various state laws, and also differing definitions of covered family members, not just a spouse, a parent, or a child like under the federal FMLA. So what does all this mean? What is all, you know, what's the implication of this? Well, these differences in eligibility under the federal FMLA standard and these paid state family medical leave laws, you know, you could really lead to what we call stacking of benefits, whereby the leave under these two laws are not the same, and therefore they don't run concurrently. Um, so that can lead to more leave, more absenteeism. Um, I think, you know, more, um, I think, burden to the employer, but I think um, particularly just the complexity of trying to administer that. Yep, that, that's that's great, Elise. And and if we can go to the, the next slide, we'll, we'll pick back up on this sort of the stacking of benefits concept. So Elise spoke about the nuances and the inconsistencies between the federal FMLA and the state PFL and PFML laws. Let, let's turn now to a topic, coordination with employer policies. It's a topic that we at SciFarth and our, our paid leave team and leave of absence team spends quite a good deal of time working with different companies and in different industries with operations in various states, figuring out how to piece together the PFL and PFML offerings with their existing company provided policies. So you might remember back at the beginning of the presentation, we were going over some key terms, things like PSL for paid sick leave, things like PPL for paid parental leave or STD for short-term disability, all of that comes into play here. So for starters, we're thinking about coordination. Right? The coordination with time off benefits, which is typically PTO, sick, vacation, personal time, floating holidays, and so forth, versus leave benefits, parental leave and short-term disability and so on, differs. These are different benefits, as we spoke about earlier, and how they should be treated in terms of coordination with a state PFL law should be given different considerations given the, the distinctions between those types of benefits. However, there are several of the state PFL and PFML programs that are silent or ambiguous on these topics and don't differentiate between the time off versus the leave for purposes of their standards on coordination with company policies. Another thing that complicates this space is that coordination involves multiple things. It involves, number one, hey, can I run these benefits together, the state PFL benefits and my company provided benefits? Can I, can I run them concurrently? 
Or, as Elise was mentioning with respect to the FMLA and inconsistencies there, do these benefits stack? Will that lead to greater absenteeism, greater burdens on coworkers and on managers to pick up the, 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 the slack when workers are absent for more uh, uh, amounts of time, greater lengths than contemplated by the PFL laws, perhaps because of this stacking? In addition to running the benefits concurrently, another piece with the coordination involves the pay component. Can I offset my pay if I have a company provided benefit that is providing some level of compensation, maybe full compensation? Is there a reimbursement component? What percentage is gonna be paid by me, the company and my policy versus the program? And those nuances also need to be worked out and thought through by the employer. When we look at certain examples here, Washington State and Oregon come to mind as two of the laws where the standards are designed in a way that is confusing and that is vague and ambiguous on some of these topics. For example, Washington State talks does not address paid parental leave or short-term disability. It simply says that employers can offer supplemental benefit payments to employees for family or medical leave in addition to the state benefits. And those supplemental benefits include vacation, sick time, or other paid time off. And whether that other paid time off is broad enough to include paid parental leave, short-term disability, that's where the gray area exists. The new Oregon law that just went online last month has a similar ambiguous language, but adds in, instead of using the phrase other paid time off, uses the phrase other paid leave earned by the employee, creating another wrinkle <clears throat> and its own separate analysis. Then by comparison, you look at a place like Colorado, again, that law starts in just a few months. Colorado's program has clear distinctions between interplay with paid time off, sick vacation PTO, saying that in no circumstances can a worker be required to use or exhaust those paid time off benefits prior to or, or while receiving PFML under their program, but they can agree to run them uh, concurrently and use the benefits if, if the company and worker agree to do so. But with PFML paid parental leave and disability, there Colorado does say that the employer can require the payment to be made or taken concurrently between the state program and those company offerings. So lots of variations, lots of complexities, and as we said, it can lead to stacking and confusion among companies' benefits, HR, legal, and so forth. If you go to the next slide, let's talk one more topic interrelated to what I at least was going over just a minute ago on these overlapping leave laws. Specifically, let's talk about not just the FMLA and how it coordinates with state PFL and PFML programs, but other state leave laws that are offered as well. The state unpaid FML laws that we spoke about briefly during the first segment of today's webinar. Disability laws at the state, federal, or local levels. Domestic violence victim leave laws, as Christina and Renata mentioned during the infographic discussion, a lot of these laws are starting to cover things like safe time or domestic violence victim leave. A lot of these laws cover military leave. They also can potentially cover paid sick and you know, absences that overlap with paid sick and safe time laws. So when we're dealing with this, this potential overlap, it creates a struggle for nationwide and multi-state employers to manage their day-to-day -day employee leaves because determining how much leave the employee is entitled to will vary based on the state federal, local laws that apply, as well as the company policies that are in the mix. And this creates, again, for company departments, HR, benefits, legal, payroll, people relations, a struggle to understand this interplay, especially where those teams sort of are, are, are lacking sort of a robust team members in those departments. And that then can have a trickle down effect on workers and can lead to confusion among employees and managers on the ground. So thinking about the amounts of leave, the reasons, the family members, what do the laws say on running the times concurrently between PFL and unpaid FML or PFL and a state domestic violence victim leave law? Will the time off be paid? What's the amount of pay and is there job protection? Those are some of the areas that need to be assessed to understand this interplay and whether the time will run concurrently or whether the time will stack. And with that, I'm gonna turn it to Christina to talk about another complexity in this space dealing with private plan offerings. All right, thanks, Josh. Next slide, please. All right, so as we noted earlier, you know, there are a number of locations that allow private plans and there's been a clamoring by multi-state employers for an option that would say, can we just purchase insurance that would cover everything? Or can we just have one you know, self-insured plan that would allow us to comply with all of the jurisdictions and exempt us from the, the state programs? But unfortunately, the complexity in this area makes it really hard to do this. 
So as I noted earlier, there's two jurisdictions that don't even allow you to have private plane exemptions, DC and Rhode Island. But then the other locations, the requirements to be able to get that exemption are varied and burdensome. Um, so there's all of the substantive topics that we talked about and how they need to align. Because, you know, as, as a, I'm sure you're all aware, you know, to have a private plan, it has to meet or exceed all of the substantive criteria under the state program. But then in addition to that, there's all of these nuanced administrative criteria. Um, everything from, you know, when you get your application in, you know, some renewer, renewals are due annually, some every three years. Um, you know, there's application fees, uh, there's security deposit and bank and separate bank account, account requirements. There's, um, you know, some places employee contributions have to be held in trusts and, you know, a majority of employees in some cases have to agree to the plan. Um, so, for example, um, California, Connecticut, and New Jersey have all some sort of, you know, voting that needs to go, you know, happen with, uh, with employees to be able to approve a plan. Um, you know, providing regular reports to the state and when those reports are due, um, state audits of, of, of certain claims, and then the review and appeals process requirements. So these are all things that need to be considered um, when, you know, applying for a private plan and uh, makes it difficult to have, a, you know, a really easy one size, you know, fits all kind of uh, product to be able to that for employers to buy or, or, or use. All right, next slide. I think uh, back to me now and the, how to deal with the issue of intermittent leave can be incredibly confusing and challenging for employers, notably because there is not one uniform definition under these different state laws about how to deal with intermittent leave and particularly with respect to paid family and medical leave benefits to bond with a new child. And unlike the uh, federal FMLA, which only permits um, intermittent leave with the approval of the employee and employer consent for this, most of these states do not. Um, and again, the difference in the amount of increments that is allowed that uh, can be allowed for intermittent leave varies widely, and sometimes. The increments can be as small as, you know, as one day. And I think that this can be incredibly challenging just from the manager perspective and try to manage when you don't need an employer consent to do this to figure out how you're going to actually, you know, run your workplace. Um, and I think also just, you know, some examples of paid family and medical leave laws that don't require a minimum number of hours or days or weeks that the employee must use to take the benefits. For example, in California, <clears throat> other states like, minima, like Maine do set a minimum um, increment that's eight hours. Um, in Maryland, uh, I think the minimum is four hours. So you can see just the divergence, the lack of uniformity with respect to you know the um, being able to take intermittent leave, uh, the increments of leave can be incredibly challenging to manage your workplace. And if we wrap all this up here and all of these challenges that we've been talking about created by this patchwork of different state and local laws, maybe you can turn to the next slide now. I think hey, it's hey, really being driven. Hey, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Josh, yeah. No worries. Su super quick. I'm just going to read the uh, the CLE code before we jump into the federal uh, activity oh, chart. Sure. So, okay. so for for folks, uh, the the CLE code for today, um, before we jump into federal, is SS as in Cypharth Shaw, three six four eight. And again, the CLE code is SS as in Cypharth Shaw 3648, SS 3648. All yours, Eilis. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. So next slide, please. So the, the previous, whatever, 32 slides were really all because I think driven in large part by the fact that there is not a federal paid family and medical leave program. And that is really spurred 
a lot of these states to kind of go on their own and enact their own versions of paid family and medical leave laws. It doesn't mean that um, Congress has not in some way or another looked at the issue of family um, and family and medical leave and recognizing that it is an incredibly important tool to be able to balance work and family. And I think especially, you know, during the pandemic, I think that issue became even more, you know, front of mind. But what do we have? We have basically um, the you know, Republicans and Democrats taking very divergent views of what a proposal or what a federal solution to paid family and medical leave would be. What we do have is the unpaid FMLAs for the past 30 years. But, you know, beyond that, how to add a paid component of it, um, the approaches to that differ widely. I think Republicans have largely been focused, at least, you know, before this Congress on really looking at a tax credit and ways to try to incentivize or encourage employers to offer paid family and medical leave. Um, the current employer uh, tax credit for paid family and medical leave under Section 45S of the Internal Revenue Code has been extended uh, through 2025. Um, that, however, I mean, for some employers that might um, be, they might have availed themselves of that. For a number of others, they haven't. And I think notably, that tax credit doesn't really do anything to address this patchwork of state and local laws. Um, as I mentioned, you know, as I mentioned before, the pandemic really shined a light on the need for uh, paid family and medical leave to protect this, the, the health of yourself and your family members and your workers. And so there was some specific uh, COVID related um, federal paid leave uh, programs and tax benefits um, that uh, expired. So where are we right now? Um, we're still pretty far apart in terms of different approaches that Democrats and Republicans had, but we also have maybe the contours of where some compromise could be, or maybe some effort to try to find some bipartisan improvements around the edges. Notably, the biggest Democratic proposal um, that we'll talk about is the Family Act, the Family and Medical Leave uh, Insurance Leave Act that's been reintroduced numerous Congresses. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about an effort, the last Congress, to include paid family and medical leave under the what ultimately became the Inflation Reduction Act that was earlier called the Build Back Better Act and family medical leave um, was not ultimately included that legislation. And also what we've seen this Congress, um, the Fair Leave Act, which is a bipartisan effort to address a targeted issue. Um, so let's just spend maybe just a few minutes going over what those what the current proposals are and maybe end on possibly a hopeful note about Congress trying to address some of these challenges. Um, next slide, please. So I mentioned the Family Act. This is legislation that's been introduced numerous Congress as by Senator Kristen Gillibrand from New York um, in the Senate and uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLora in the House. And basically it would create a new federally run paid family and medical leave program which closely tracks, but not entirely, uh, the requirements of, uh, the, pay, of the unpaid fate, uh, family and medical leave law. Um, it would be funded by payroll taxes to the employees and the employers. Um, it is not, however, tied to employment. That means that employees would take their eligibility to this federal, uh, federally run program with it. Um, and there are, you know, additional reasons that are not included in the FMLA that someone would be eligible for this program. Um, now, um, it does nothing, however, to, again, address this issue of preempting, if you will, or providing uniformity 
with state, with existing state family and medical leave laws. So if this were to be enacted, you would have a new federal program, but it would not expressly preempt or displace those state requirements too. Um, I think this in this current political, um, you know, the current political environment that we have in a divided government, um, you know, this is a non-starter. Um, it's not going to get through the House. Um, you know, I think it's unlikely to get 60 votes in the Senate. Um, but we do know that, you know, that, that this is something um, that remains very much a priority for congressional Democrats. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, Democrat, congressional Democrats tried to take a slightly different tact than the Family Act last Congress it, with the Build Back Better Act, which was um, also would have created a new federally run pay family and medical leave program. But I think an important difference from the Family Act was that it would include an incentive or encouragement for private plans for employers who wanted to offer their own private plans um, that met certain requirements. It, however, did not um, displace or preempt um, existing state laws either. So ultimately, um, for a whole host of reasons um, that was not ultimately included in last year's budget reconciliation bill, which became the Inflation Reduction Act. So where that left Congress last year was really, you know, no traction on paid family and medical leave at the congressional level, at the federal level, um, and the parties pretty far apart on their views. But fast forward to this Congress, um, last slide, please, next slide, please. And I think we do at least see the seeds of, oh, actually, let me mention the FAIR Act. Um, yeah, let me mention the FAIR Act. We do see some seeds of at least some you know, bipartisan discussions around this issue. Um, there's a bipartisan legislation, the Fair Leave Act, um, and, you know, it's, it's not a game changer, but it would address this limitation on leave for married couples under the FMLA. You know, I think that's important because, you know, again, you've got, you know, bipartisan legislation, you know, looking at the issue of paid family and medical leave, but next slide, please. I think really where the attention and action, if there's going to be some, is really gonna be coming from this House bipartisan working group on paid uh, family leave that formed at the end of last year and really kicked into gear the beginning of this Congress, led by Republican Stephanie Bice from Oklahoma and Democrat Chrissy Houlihan from Pennsylvania, um, and four other members that came together at the beginning of this Congress and said, look, let's, we need to work together to try to find a solution that works for both employers for businesses and employees. So they have been trying to gather information, speak to different stakeholders, seek input about what those solutions would be. I had an opportunity to speak um, at one of these listening sessions and present this excellent chart that um, that you all prepared and that we were able to distribute to the members and staff to really show about the complexity and challenges of these patchwork of different state laws. You know, I think the good news is, is that there seemed to be at least some receptiveness and appreciation of that concern for nationwide employers. But I think, you know, there's still a challenge as the working group tries to develop legislative proposals and I think, you know, potentially figure out how to coordinate those efforts with the Senate. So I think there's still a long way to go before federal uh, paid family medical leave legislation um, is enacted into law. But I think this uh, bipartisan working group and their efforts are an important first step. Yeah, thank you so much, Elise. That 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 is wonderful insight, lot, lots of great detail about the many moving pieces uh, and, and where things stand at the federal level, uh, which is a question that, that we certainly at SIFAR get asked regularly uh, from, from our clients about when is this patchwork going to be resolved? When is it going to get cleaned up? 
still a little ways away, but baby steps in the right direction. So it's so really, really helpful. We're going to wrap up on the next slide, and you can go one more after that with just a few final thoughts um, for starters. Uh, as you'll see on this slide, we have both a paid family leave comprehensive offering that covers all of the existing state laws that were discussed today across more than 25 different substantive topics. Um, and you, we also have a paid leave mailing list that you can sign up for to get our PFL uh, updates and blog posts and, and so forth. As we write about it, you'll, you'll get the information. So you can sign up with the link there and you can also reach out about the survey to that paid leave at SciFarth.com email address. Uh, next slide, please. You'll also see another resource for you if you're struggling and, and dealing with challenges in this space, as many companies and many industries are, is this webinar series. Today was part nine. You can see what we've covered the first uh, eight parts of the series. Uh, in addition, um, we have a Take It or Leave It podcast. We just rolled out our 25th and 26th episodes over the last few weeks. Uh, in the next uh, month or so, we're actually going to have the director of Paid Leave Oregon joining us uh, for uh, an episode of the the webinar of the of the podcast. So, if anyone has questions and is dealing with sort of the the initial struggles of uh, Paid Leave Oregon and that new program that came online last month, definitely stay tuned for that podcast episode coming in the next few weeks. And then finally, on our next slide, you'll see uh, American Benefits Council has wonderful resources as well. You can visit uh, the council's website, AmericanBenefitsCouncil.org, to get more information. Among their resources is a paid leave atlas that has a, a nice detailed look across the country at both paid family leave and paid sick leave laws and the patchworks in both of those spaces. In addition, the council has benefit bites publications that are available for member companies as well. And you can follow the council on social media to get more information on their activities in this space. And with that, we'd like to thank everybody for sending in uh, their questions, uh, as well as for joining us today. A recording of the presentation, as well as the slide deck, will be made available and sent out to folks uh, in the coming days. And be on the lookout for more information from our paid leave team uh, in the next few days with more paid sick leave and paid family leave activity. Thank you so much, everyone.